sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Not Recommended for Guests of a Philosophically Uncertain Disposition by Michelle Ann King Demita managed the Fracture's visitor center and gift shop, while Jem took the guided tours. There was also a café which always had fresh coffee and an inventive selection of hot sandwiches, although Demita had never met anyone who worked in the kitchens. They're all very industrious, just hardly introverted, Jem said. You should go and get one of today's specials, Cajun pheasant and fried pickles on a toasted sesame seed bagel. Mmm, marvelous. Sounds a bit rich for breakfast, Demita said. Maybe later. A stock delivery had arrived in the night, and she was working her way through the boxes. They contained fridge magnets, earplugs, bandages with pictures of cacti on them, and snow globes. Demita picked one up and shook it. Black glitter fell on a scale model of the visitor center, and lightning flashed. Food is important, Jem said. Blood sugar should be kept within optimal parameters to ensure emotional stability. It says so in the employee handbook. Demita put a bunch of the snow globes on a shelf and used a rolled-up brochure to push them into place. The gift shop was green this week, an unsettling luminous green, with fixtures and fittings made from a molded black plastic that looked like it would be soft and possibly clammy to the touch. Small, regular meals, Jem went on. Human food is recommended for convenience of digestion. Page 62, Section 5. You have read it, haven't you? Sure, sure, Demita said, sticking a set of scorpion-shaped magnets to the display board. Well, not entirely. It's pretty long, but I'm working through it. She went back to the boxes and pulled out a bag of woolly gloves. They were the same green as the walls. Gloves? It's a hundred and twenty in the shade out here. Who needs gloves? People who don't want to leave fingerprints, Jem said. She glanced over. Nice color. I'll take a pair. Demita shrugged and rang them up at staff discount. Jem never seemed to feel the heat anyway. It's because I'm English, she'd explained once. We're born with fog and rain in our bone marrow. It's like an internal air conditioning system. Jem used to work in London, but lost her job at the start of the last financial crisis. How she'd ended up in the fracture was a complicated story involving a diverted flight, a gangster's mother-in-law, and twelve hours locked in the trunk of a car. Somehow, she managed to make it seem like a logical sequence of events. For Demita's part, she'd left home looking for adventure, not a job. She'd imagined the wind rushing through her hair and the miles disappearing under her wheels. Maybe she'd hit California. Maybe Utah. Maybe Mexico. As it turned out, she'd made it as far as the turnoff for US-93 before stopping at a diner for lunch where she picked up a flyer advertising the fracture. It sounded like exactly the sort of fun, impulsive side trip a true adventurer would take. So she'd driven up to the visitor center and wandered inside. Jem had given her an appraising look and said, You look like someone who can cope with weird shit. Demita laughed. I was raised in Vegas, so yeah, I guess you could say that. Sold, Jem said. And before Demita had even realized it was an interview, she'd been given a uniform, a blue t-shirt with an aerial photograph of the visitor center on the front and last exit before the end of Euclidean space on the back, a key to the restroom, and a copy of the employee handbook. Which she probably should try and get around to reading at some point. Do you ever wonder about all this? She said. Jem looked up. Or what? This, Demita said, sweeping her arms wide. Us, the visitor center, souvenir snow globes. Is it right? I'm not sure it's right. Should we really be treating this place as a tourist attraction? Jem shrugged and peeled off the gloves. What else are we supposed to do with it? 
That's kind of what I mean. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't be doing anything with it. Maybe it should just be left alone and disappoint the visitors. Demita looked around. The center, as usual, was empty. What tourists there were always barreled straight past, magnetized by the greater attractions of Las Vegas on the skyline. You should have more faith, Jem said. In what? Fate. There's a tour group on their way here right now. A secret society of spiritual seekers, inexorably drawn by the alignment of esoteric energies. I can feel it in the feathers. Jem had been trying to teach herself to predict the future by casting vulture feathers, although the results had been mixed so far. I'm not really sure I believe in the accuracy of feathers, Demita said. Or in fate, come to that. I'll bet it still believes in you, Jem said. She took her feathers out of their little leather pouch and spread them on the reception desk. Demita sneezed, blowing them into the air and reducing at least four of them to tiny pieces of damp fluff. <coughs> Sorry, she said. I think I might be allergic to vultures. Jem gazed at the destruction. I knew you were going to say that, she said mournfully. The tour group arrived about an hour later, eight men tumbling out of a minibus in a flurry of cowboy hats, sunburns, and alcohol fumes. I see, Jem said, jotting something in a notebook. So, an acute angle at that degree in a five-feather spread means stag do, not secret society of spiritual seekers. Useful distinction. I'll have to remember that. The men filed inside, whooping and hollering. Hey there, doll, the leader said. He leaned onto the front desk and grinned at Jem. I'm Cody. We've come to see your crack. The men behind him sniggered. I'm sure I'll be equally delighted to see you, Jem said. That'll be ten dollars each, and please pay careful attention to the safety information on the reverse of your tickets. Kindly read, absorb, and apply as required. Yeah, yeah, Cody said. He folded the tickets without looking at them and stuffed them into the back pocket of his shorts. These places are lame, one of the others said. They'll tell you all this stuff about how the laws of physics don't apply and water runs uphill or whatever, but it's not real. It's all just tilted rooms and optical illusions. That's what's often called a mystery spot, Jem said. And yes, young man, you're quite right. The effects are achieved through tricks of perspective, but the fracture isn't a mystery spot. The young guy didn't look mollified. What is it then? That's actually quite a tricky question. Some people say that it's an alien crash site. Some that it's where the last of the primordial gods departed this world. Others think it's the battlefield of a secretly fought and barely averted supernatural apocalypse. Jem looked around at each of the men in turn. Maybe you'll agree with one of these theories. Maybe you'll come up with your own. You don't need to know what the fracture is to enjoy your time here. But we do recommend that you know who you are. The best way to approach the fracture is with a strong, unwavering sense of yourself and your specific place in the universe. She smiled. Plus a sturdy pair of walking shoes, sunscreen, and a half liter of water per person, all of which are available for purchase in the gift shop, for your convenience. We have a 50% discount on all snow globes today, and please note that flash photography and video recording are strictly prohibited. Any questions? Got any beer? Cody asked. The ingestion of intoxicating substances can be useful for the expansion of consciousness during meditative rites, Jem said. But it's not particularly recommended otherwise. Do you think you'll be meditating today? Cody just blinked at her. The rest of the group followed suit. After a while, Jem shrugged. There are six packs in the cooler. Cody whooped. <laughs> now you're talking our language! Demita frowned as she watched him crack open a can of bud. Since when did we start carrying beer? We carry whatever the guests ask for, Jem said and clapped her hands. Okay, are we all ready? Then let's go. 
Good luck, Demita called after them. The minibus sat in the middle of the parking lot, slowly turning the same sandy color as everything else. After a while, the door slid open and a man, older than the others and without a cowboy hat, stumbled out. He yawned and scratched a gray stubbled cheek, then came inside. Huh, he said, looking around. Guess I must have fallen asleep. I'm Orson. I was supposed to be with the bachelor party. My son's the groom. Sorry, Demita said. You missed them. They went out on the tour about half an hour ago. Can I go and catch them up? Sorry, sir. I can't let you do that. Not without a guide. Why? It's not dangerous, is it? That probably depends on your definition of the word. What do you mean by that? He frowned. Hey, is my boy gonna be okay? That probably depends on his definition of the word. Orson glared at her. What the hell is this place? That's kind of a tricky question. Some people say it's an alien. Orson held up a hand. All right, that's enough. I want to get my son and get out of here. When are they going to be back? Demita pulled one of the walkie-talkies off the rack and keyed it. Jem? Jem, do you copy? It crackled, then Jem's voice came on. She sounded out of breath. I'm here. Oh, we're doing okay. It's a bit squally, but we're hanging in there. Over. Orson glanced back through the large plate window at the broiling sunshine outside and gave Demita a quizzical look. She gave him her best reassuring smile, which might, judging by his reaction, need a little more work. She brought the walkie-talkie back up again. When do you expect to get back, Jem? There was a burst of static. Then Jem said, Return ETA about an hour. Your time? Your time? Orson said. What does she mean by your time? Where the hell have they gone? Demita offered him another smile. That's also kind of a tricky question, she said. Why don't you get some lunch while you wait? The cafe does some very nice sandwiches. What are your feelings about Cajun pheasant and fried pickles? Wait, wait, don't tell me, Jem said. She extended her hands over the pile of bones on the cafe table and wiggled her fingers. There's a dead rattlesnake in the cactus garden. That's what you're going to say. No, Demita said. All the rattlesnakes have been dead for years. You know that. Jem sighed, her shoulders sagging. Divination is definitely more art than science, you know. She gathered up the bones, shook them in a cupped hand, then re-scattered them. You look perturbed. What's wrong? You're not still worrying about that guy, what was his name? Cody, are you? Demita poured herself a coffee and tucked the money under the Be Back Soon sign on the counter. Kinda, yeah, a bit. Aren't you? You saw him. Jim waved a hand. A minor digestive disturbance. He'll be fine after a good night's sleep and plenty of green leafy vegetables. Maybe a little therapy. Some light psychophilosophical reconstruction. She shrugged. I did try to warn them about beer. Anyway, he signed the full liability waiver, so no harm done. I don't know, Demita said, staring into her cup. Maybe we should just leave, put up the closed sign and clear out. We could go to Disney World, get work there. Or Stonehenge, or Area 51, or the Bermuda Triangle. I'm sure we'd be qualified. Jem pulled a battered copy of the employee handbook out of her purse and slid it across the cafe table. Page 1,211, she said. Section 5, paragraph 2. You really ought to read this, you know. It's very good. Demita looked it up. No member of staff, their dependents or descendants should ever, under any circumstances, attempt to get work at Area 51 or Disney World. Demita sighed, finished her coffee, and threw the cup in the trash. The money she'd left was gone. Tell you what, Jem said. How about we flip for it? If you win, we leave. If I win, we stay. All right, Demita said. 
She took a quarter out of her pocket and sent it somersaulting into the air, then caught it and slapped it on the back of her hand. Heads or tails? Cactus, Jem said. Demita lifted her hand and checked the coin, which showed an engraving of a prickly pear. She turned it over and saw the same design on the back. That's cheating, she said. That's fate, Jem said. She stared at the bones on the table, then pushed her chair back and stood up. But you're leaving anyway, aren't you? Demita nodded. Her stuff was already in a box, sitting on the back seat of her Chevy. At the last minute, she'd added a snow globe and a leftover beetroot and banana sandwich. She looked up at Jem and waited for what she would say next. Bye, then. Don't go. Send me a postcard. Can I come with you? Demita spun the coin, watching it glint in the sun as it moved across the table. She wished she'd learned the art of divination. Jem leaned down and pressed her lips, light as a grain of sand, against the corner of Demita's mouth. I'll see you soon, she said. Demita's watch said it was three o'clock in the morning, but the sun was still glowing overhead, so something had clearly gone awry with that. The road from the visitor center back to the 93 was straight, with no turnoffs, so there was no way she could have gotten lost. But she'd been driving for miles, and the road just wasn't this long. She'd eaten her sandwich hours ago, and there was still nothing on the horizon ahead but sand, rocks and the occasional sprout of cactus. Directly ahead of her was a dead rattlesnake. Demita opened the glove box and rooted around for her phone, but the only thing inside was a copy of the employee handbook. She stopped the car, closed her eyes, and rested her forehead on the steering wheel. It burned. When she opened her eyes again and looked in the rearview mirror, the reflection of the visitor center looked back at her. She turned the car around and pulled back into her allocated space in the parking lot. She left the box in the back seat and went inside, up to the front desk. One, please, she said and handed over a ten-dollar bill. Of course, madam, Jem said and gave her a ticket. Come right this way. Have you ever been on a tour with us before? Demita shook her head. I don't think I've ever felt philosophically certain about myself and my specific place in the universe. And now, Jem said, holding out a hand. She was wearing new gloves. These ones were neon orange and had pictures of sandwiches on them. I guess we'll see, Demita said, and took her hand. Michelle Ann King is a writer of speculative, crime, and horror fiction whose work has appeared in over a hundred different venues, including Strange Horizons, Interzone, and Black Static. Her story collections are available in ebook and paperback from Amazon and other retailers. See www.transientcactus.co.uk for details. Hey guys, hope you liked that story. What I really loved about this piece was just how open-ended the world was. You have no idea what this fracture is, what's really going on. There's a lot of bizarre little things happening, and I love that. It's a really good example of cow tools, which if you've never heard that term, it's something that Gary Larson from The Far Side ended up coining. And it's just basically, you give a little bit of detail and then the reader or viewer or whatever extrapolates more information based on that. You come to your own conclusions about what's actually going on. It's one of my favorite literary techniques, and this story had just tons of that going on. I would love to know what's actually going on at this location, but I think that's part of the point, is that you're not supposed to know. It's supposed to be bizarre and weird and just kind of like a mystery spot. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If you did, be sure to leave a thumbs up and a comment on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast version, just be sure to subscribe for more brand new short stories. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.